Have you ever wondered or thought about what it means when someone says, hey, you're using fiction babble, you're babbling. Have you ever taken the time to parse the word babbling, B-A-B-B-L-E, or B-A-B-B-L-I-N-G, those types of things. Have you ever taken the time to parse them, look them up, find the earliest nativity root meanings of these particles within the word? Now we can think of uh, religious connotations such as the Tower of Babel, which was a town in Babylon. If you look at the word Babylon, you see the word baby and an L-O-N and Babel. And although, as I will show later on in the video, the etymology online claims that there is no connection between B-A-B-E-L and B-A-B-B-L-E, I'm going to show that there is actually. And it's a very common sense logical connection. So I'm going to go through some of the biblical connotations of this word, these words, because that's a huge part of the culture of Earth, is the Abrahamic religions. And I'm going to use the King James 1611 version to show a couple things uh, in the continuance of the evidence as we travel down this road parsing these words Babel, Babylon, and Babel, B-A-B-E-L. So I hope you enjoy it. To go with what I said in the intro about researching some of the biblical connotations and meanings for the words Babylon and Babel, B-A-B-E-L, I first decided to find out, well, when was Genesis written? Because Genesis is the book, the first book of the Bible, the first book of the Torah, where the, these things are mentioned, and they're mentioned in a specific context. So I just Googled it, and uh, I found that there are some evidence of fragments of Genesis happening in what we will call, for political correct correctness, BCE, but that the first complete manuscripts were found in CE. So it says here, the oldest complete copy is this Codex Leningradensis. <laughs> and then I go a little bit further and it says, when was the first copy of Genesis written? Genesis was written in roughly 550 BCE. The book of Genesis is the first book of the Bible and the first of five books is the Pentateuch, I suppose which were all written by Moses. Really? So then we go a little further and uh, says, who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses. Tradition credits Moses. But modern scholars from 19th century onward see them as being written hundreds of years after Moses is supposed to have lived in the 6th and 5th centuries B.C. And when we go to the entry for this codex here, we find that it was written in about 1008 or 1009 CE, way, way, way after this fictional character known as Moses was said to exist. So that's that. In any case, for our purposes, we're looking at these words. We're looking at parse and etymology. So I chose to use the uh, King James 1611 Bible with the original archaic English spelling. Now we see here in chapter 10 in... Uh, 
verse 5. It goes on through these genealogies, and it says, and this is right after the flood. This is what was happening after the flood. You know, the flood where uh, God made creation, and then uh, he loved them, and he's an all-loving God. Then he decided to wipe them all out. And, uh, but now they're back and repopulating the earth. And it says, by these were the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families and their nations. Does that cause you to think or get the impression, the sensation that they were divided in their lands, meaning the Gentiles, each whatever, their family, their nations, they were divided. And they had their own nation, they had their own family, they had their own lands, and they had their own tongue, which means language, right? So at this point in time, after the flood, these families had populated the earth, they had their own nations, they had their own language. So you had these people over here um, who had their own language, and then these people over here who had a different language. That's the way I take that. So then we go to Genesis chapter 11, and the very first verse says, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Hold up a minute. We just said here that the Gentiles were divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations, implying that Things were separate. Everybody had their own families, their own language, their own nation. But here, suddenly, it's one language. Just one of literally multitudes of contradictions in uh, this book. Anyways, just wanted to point that out. Because this is important because it sets up the whole scenario of Babel. So then we go to where they're building the tower. So these people in this city, which is unnamed at this point, are building a tower because they want to have the top of it reach into heaven and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad the face of, upon the face of the whole earth. So for some reason, after they've already been scattered, each unto his own nation, his own family his own language now suddenly that's not the case anymore now they're all in one place in this whatever this area is and now suddenly after having already been scattered i guess they don't want to become scattered again so they build a tower i'm not sure how that works with how they won't be scattered anymore but they start building a tower and then the lord you know as if he didn't already know this is going to happen he comes down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people, the people is one. <laughs> and they have all one language as if he didn't know that already. OK. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth and they left off to build the city. Therefore, is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now, if you remember back to chapter 10, it wasn't so much in the context of being confounded, but each family and each nation had their own language. So I guess the Lord had already done that. Maybe he forgot. Or maybe he just decided, okay, let's make them all one language so that we can just bust them all up again and confuse everybody again 
And, you know, I don't know. I'm sure there are many, many, many quote unquote educated uh, people, scholars who will study this. And I'm sure people will take their interpretations on a much less logical level in a more uh, agenda based level. And uh, it's whatever interpretation you want. I mean, it's all written in Babel, literally, adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun. Um, so what are you going to do except syntax the whole thing and uh, call it a day? In any case, we're going to go and look at the etymology of Babel. Capital of Babylon. Now a ruin. Late 14th century. Late 14th century. From late Latin. From Hebrew. Babel. Genesis 11, which we were just looking at. From Akkadian. Gate of God. From Bab, which means gate. Plus Ilu, which means God in Akkadian. The name is a translation of Sumerian ka dinger, meaning confused medley of sounds. Now, here's a red flag for me. How do you go from gate of God to confused medley of sounds? The name Babel is a translation of Sumerian, meaning confused medley of sounds. It's from a biblical story of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of tongues. So I'm going to add some clarity and closure to that as we go along. So now we look at Babylon, mid-14th century, representing the Greek rendition of Akkadian, which we already said that, the gate of the gods, from gate plus god. The old Persian form shows characteristic transformation of L to R in words assimilated from Semitic, also applied, moment, arrayed in purple. And okay. That's way later. That doesn't uh, concern us. That coloring of it, that modification of it came in way later. So now let's take the particles of this word, Babylon, and let's look at the word baby. So what we're after here is the earliest nativity root mean. So, so far we have late 14th century. Baby, infant of either sex, diminutive of babe. Late 14th century, infant, young child of either sex. Short for Baban, early 13th century, which is probably imitative, imitative of baby talk. See Babel. Now, this other stuff doesn't really give us any time frame, any time, now space, location. So therefore, we wouldn't use that. We only use what we can certify here by evidence to the best of our, our knowledge here. So this early 13th century thing, which is probably imitative of baby talk, see Babel. So let's go to Babel. Okay mid 13th century to prattle utter words indistinctly talk like a baby that is the earliest we have now down here notice that they take the time to say this no direct connection with babel can be traced though association with that may have affected the sentence the senses <laughs> what Okay, so no direct connection with Babel can be traced. Let me repeat that. No direct connection with Babel can be traced. What is this? B-A-B-E-L. What is this? Confused medley of sounds from the Sumerian Kadinger, which is a translation translated into this. So first you have this, which means confused medley of sounds translated into this. And then go over to here, 
where no direct connection with Babel can be traced. But guess what? We just traced it. Confused medley of sounds. So there is a connection there. In any case, going back to 13th century. Uh, here. To prattle, utter words indistinctly, talk like a baby. Sounds a lot like confused medley of sounds, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, I'm getting a little too overboard here. Apologies for that. Uh, I, I have a passion for this, for getting to the roots of things, finding connections that I can certify and pass on to you. For those of you interested in learning correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, this is a very important aspect of it. Taking all the available evidence and sub evidence and compiling it and coming to one's own conclusions using knowledge as the authority, which is what I'm doing right now in front of your eyes. This is how it's done. This is how I do it. I use all the tools available to me, none of which, by the way, are hidden or secret. They're all available to you, the public who want to learn this. It's just taking the time to do it. So now we know what Babel is. It's basically a confused medley of sounds or prattling indistinct words, talking like a baby. For this part of the video, rather than use my dry erase board uh, for purposes of efficient conveyance, I'm just going to use my screen share uh, method here and uh, go over my correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, finite mean closure of the word Babel. And as you see here, it's uh, in basic sentence form. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna graph it as Cole and David Ivan Wayne Cole and Miller used to do to make it uh, perhaps easier for the viewer not familiar with this to cognize it and to go along with what I'm saying as I'm explaining the closures of uh, this finite mean. So you have a full colon here and the word babble. So in this case, because of the sequencing mechanics of positionals and the functions of the positionals, for is the cause, of is the concern, with is possessive, and by is the authority, the cause always starts a correct sentence structure. So in this case, this is or the babble. That's what this full colon and no space in between here. If there was a space in between here, then it would mean of the babble. And correct sentence structure does not start or begin complete sentence structure uh, with correctness, does not begin with an of the. It begins with a for the. So here we go. For the babble of this finite mean is with the claim of any communication writ or of any sound with the voidance of the closure, with the lack of the volition claim with the certification by this claim. Backwards, for this claim of the certification is with the volition claim of the lack with the closure of the voidance with any communication writ or with any sound of the claim with this finite mean by the babble. So as it is written, I'm gonna give you closure on each part of this. So the cause of the sentence is for the babble. This is the finite mean of babel. Babel is the cause. And what is the babel concerned with? With the finite mean. I'm telling you that this is the finite mean of this particular fact. This fact is singular, therefore the verb is singular, is. You always have two position lodial fact phrases, one, two, in front of the verb. It's always a cause and a concern. Never any more, never any less in order for the mathematical certification, uh, the interface on the grammar to work. So we immediately follow this singular verb with a possessive, with the claim. What is this claim concerned with? It's concerned with any communication writ or any sound. And what's possessing 
the communication writ or sound. Voidance, meaning there is a voidance of any communication writ or sound concerned with what? The closure, avoidance of the closure. What's possessing the closure? A lack, a lack of closure. What's the lack concerned with? A volition claim. So there's a lack of volition, avoidance of closure with the certification by this claim, which is the finite mean of the babel. So basically what it is saying to translate into plain, simple English, it means that any communication, whether it's written or spoken, if there is no closure on what is being written or spoken, and if there is no claim of volition behind it, you don't know what the volition is behind a communication and you don't uh, have closure on what is being communicated, then it is babble. And so that's what you see when you look at like the things we looked at earlier. Um, it's all based on assumption and presumption, which is our whole education system. There's no closure to it. Now, you can have volition and a volition claim using plain English. If there is no volition to be misunderstood, if your volition is to be understood, if your volition is to be comprehended, if your volition is to have a certification of cognition between the contract communication parties, then there's volition there. Then we can perform with honor and grace. Correct sentence structure is a grammar of closure, quantum grammar. It is a finite amount of something, a finite amount of grammar, a quantum of anything. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It doesn't go on and on like a definition, no finite contract. A finite mean means that there is closure to what we are conveying, the opposite of what Babel is. Babel is the claim of any communication writer of any sound with the avoidance of the closure with the lack of the volition claim with the certification by this claim. And that is my finite mean of Babel in the dictionary which governs my construct. So in summary, what Babel basically is, is when two or more communication parties don't understand what one another are saying or are not enjoined with one another, what one another are saying, whatever form that may take, whether it's because one contract party refuses to give closure on what it is they're saying or whether literally it's in a different language. Um, and then it comes down to volition. Is there a volition claim? As mentioned in the correct sentence structure finite mean, if there's no volition claim, then it most certainly is Babel. For example, this kitten. I know what the volition is of this kitten, I can tell. So we have a communication contract. The fiction system, on the other hand, There's way less cognition and understanding between myself and fiction system than between myself and my companion, the cat there. I'd much rather communicate with the cat than the fiction system because with the cat, it's not babble. There's a volition claim there and I understand that. And she understands my volition claim. Fiction system, not so much. Hope you've enjoyed this uh, Babel video. I'm trying some new things out. If you would like to apply for a confidential correct sentence structure communication parse syntax grammar workshop, feel free to email, email me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. I can schedule you a 10 to 15 minute face-to-face -face Zoom video consultation. I'd be happy to help you out.
Otherwise, you can just study this YouTube channel. It's all there, free to the public. Thanks for watching.